All right, so we've got uh, a lot to cover from this chapter today. Um, so uh, let's get to it. So this, um, and so, and, and by the way, if you're having any uh, issues with your project, um, there's, um, uh, you can feel free to send me an email and we can see if we can try to set up a time to meet uh, an off, uh, you know, at a, if the office hours aren't uh, convenient or if, you know, between now and Sunday, you'd like some sort of extra uh, advice, but um, there's, you know, limited time moving forward. And so uh, I can't guarantee that there's going to be a lot of availability, but um, I have still going to be got like a little bit. So if you've got um, some last minute questions you'd like to have answered that can't be answered over email that need to be answered in person, then send me a note and we can see about setting up a time. All right. Okay, so um, yeah, so this chapter nine, there was a lot in this chapter nine, but I meant it here to be an example of a um, sort of how to model a kind of complicated problem similar to the way you're doing in your, uh, your projects. And then B, um, an example of how you can take your model and, and how we can make use of these models to learn more in-depth things about these systems. And so let's kind of start with this kind of initial example that they, they opened up in this, uh, and where we, they're trying to explain these urban growth dynamics. And so the idea is if you look across a wide range of cities, including London, then you find that there tends to be this pattern where you get a, a, some growth followed by this stagnation. And so now we have a sort of a better idea of where this common pattern comes from. Uh, and, but you know, initially there was sort of an idea, or there's, there's a question of could we somehow build models that have similar patterns and then use those models to maybe learn more about the internal elements of that city dynamic. So it's likely a, a reflection of the structure of a city. So, because we see it so often, it's not like um, every city is, you know, suffers the same external event. If cities on their own with a wide variety of external environments have this sort of upward growth and then stagnation period, then it kind of implies there's something internal to the city. So could we somehow build a model that had just based on internal factors that also has this and then somehow learn from that model? And so now again, we, we kind of already kind of buy into this idea, but initially um, uh, there, this was not necessarily uh, a kind of common approach to thinking about cities. And so uh, the former mayor of Boston, shown here on the right, happened to uh, get become, kind of retire into employment at MIT and then worked down the hall from Jay Forrester, the system dynamics modeling uh, uh, personality. And uh, and after they would kind of have the conversations at lunch, then Forrester started saying, you know, maybe I can model these internal city dynamics. And if my models can produce similar dynamics, then maybe they have the promise of being able to allow us to experiment with cities in the future. And so can we even get to the point where we can reproduce these types of dynamics with these dynamical models? And so Forrester um, and, uh, uh, and this mayor uh, got together and they started to come up with the, uh, with the variables that they thought might be involved. And they drew kind of a causal loop diagram like this one that linked them all together. That kind of gave us a dynamic hypothesis for what might be driving this. And so this is, you know, you put down on paper and you say that you've got this model of how things might be connected, which is hopefully something that sort of you started doing with your final project models. And then the question would be is that if we then wire up stocks and flows according to this, then are we going to get that output from our model? And then once we do, can we do something with it? And then, so uh, those are kind of like the three kind of stages here. The first one is this hypothesis formation. So this is our dynamic hypothesis for what's going on. And so let's zoom in to see what parts are this city dynamic hypothesis. And you might use this as a template if you are have a project that's also modeling this kind of growth and stagnation type uh, processes here. So what's driving the growth? And so a reinforcement loop is probably needed somewhere. And so they focused on infrastructure and as being the thing that is ultimately being driven, is, is, is driving the growth here. And so the, the thought here is if we have um, uh, in, in a city, the expansion of infrastructure, which is um, over here, maybe I'll turn on my pointer, 
which is um, over here on the right. With more expansion of infrastructure over time, you're eventually going to get more infrastructure. And then as you get more infrastructure, then the thought is you will then have more resources to fund more expansion of infrastructure. And then that's going to create this, this uh, growth loop here. But then you say, well, then what has to limit that? Well, ultimately, you know, a tree can't grow to the sky, a city can't grow forever. And so you think of what are the, more, the most fundamental limits? And before even getting into the, the, the kind of social aspects of these limits, then you kind of think it through and you say, you know what, just there's just a physical limit to how big a city can grow. And that's the land limit. So we're gonna add in these variables. And so as you get more infrastructure, your total infrastructure increases. And as that total infrastructure in increases, then the amount of land it's using increases. And then ultimately that is going to then limit the further expansion. So already we're seeing this potential S-shaped growth coming out of here. But if we wanna really understand all of these dynamics, we'd like to throw in potentially other sorts of things that could be limiting. And then, so then that gets into thinking about, well, that infrastructure, it's not only limited by the land it's sitting on, but the infrastructure ages itself. And that infrastructure, as it crumbles, it's like it's lost. So it's, and that's, that's ultimately going to limit um, how our city can grow and maybe even cause our city to shrink as infrastructure we've invested in becomes unable to be used. And so there is an aging loop where new, infra uh, new uh, infrastructure that may be able to, to power growth uh, over some time, some delay, becomes old infrastructure. And that old infrastructure um, is, as you get more old infra infrastructure, that necessarily means you're getting less new infrastructure because that old infrastructure is displacing new infrastructure. I can't build anything new if there's an old thing sitting there. So the new stuff becomes old and then it prevents you from building other new stuff. And then that old infrastructure feeds in to the land process down here as well. <clears throat> so that's all the like physical limitations. So we have a land limit, we have the aging of infrastructure, and then we can think, well, what's another tier of this? And that other tier, um, so that's our physical stuff, and that other tier is the social side of things. And on the social side of things, you can say, well, if you have a lot of new infrastructure, new buildings and things like that, you're gonna make a pretty attractive city. And hopefully that attractive city is going to attract people to your city, and that's gonna create an inward migration of people coming into the city and that's gonna increase your population, which might ultimately be good for your city. But as you get an increased population, then ultimately it's going to make it harder for more people, for new people to decide that they wanna come in and, uh, and come, continue to come back to your city. So you end up finding that you have this, um, that with increased urban population that can actually end up, and I think there's a minus sign that's maybe being left off here, but with more urban population, that can potentially have a negative effect on your city attractiveness because it, you get like less per individual available, less of the city's benefits are available per unit person. And then on top of that, there is this external factor because all of those were endogenous factors. Well, now there's an exogenous factor that we just put as a parameter, but we could imagine changing that parameter over time, which is the attractiveness of alternative cities. So in this model, this kind of a gives you an idea that we could say based on a, one, a city's dynamics, if we hypothetically make another city more attractive, does that, how does that affect the growth of the current city that we're focusing on? So, all of those things we say go into our big model of the city and that is our dynamic hypothesis. So a uh, hypothesis is a possible answer to a research question. So we've got this process where we start with a research question, we come up with a hypothesis. So our research question might be, you know, how does infrastructure affect um, the growth of a city? You know, that's our research question. It's a nice how question. And then our hypothesis is phrased in terms of this causal loop diagram. Here's how I think infrastructure is affecting the growth of the city. I think ultimately there's infrastructure here and it has a, a reinforcing loop, but it's tied to all these other processes and limits. And so ultimately, even though infrastructure gets kicked off, the growth that is fueled by infrastructure will ultimately be its demise because it will end up limiting itself. And so that's my hypothesis. And so um, I would like to build a simulation model to test that hypothesis. And so that's my generation of predictions. 
is the stuff that comes out of the simulation model. And then when I actually then run the simulation model, I can compare it to data and see if my simulation model matches my data. And if it does, that gives me an idea that maybe this infrastructure that I've put at the center of this model really is a major explanatory variable for the growth of the city. But if I get totally different dynamics out, then maybe I'm missing something. And maybe it's not just all about infrastructure. So what's our next step? How do we build these predictions? Well, so I've got all these variables in the causal loop diagram. And so I've set that on the side. And then I say, how do I add dynamics? And so I then at this point, and you could imagine doing this in your final project, going from that causal loop diagram and then saying, what are the stocks? What are the things that change over time? And it might be easy to break those out into sectors. And so that's effectively these things that are seen on the right here. So I've got these three sectors and inside each sector, I've come up with three stocks. And it doesn't have to be three stocks and you know, it could be 10 stocks in one sector and two stocks in another, but it just happens to be it's three stocks in three sectors. And so I can say that in industry, it has these three dynamic variables. So I'm keeping track of how many new businesses, how many mature businesses, and how many declining businesses. And you can kind of think of this as like an S, I, R model. So you can almost think of this as like the uh, new business is, um, ends up getting infected with maturity. And then, but then as it gets affected with maturity, it then becomes a recovered business or something. The semantics don't quite work out. The meetings here don't quite work out, but you can quite see, I hope, that you can see that I've got just three compartments connected together, just like an SIR model. And then I've got down in housing. Uh, so I can zoom into my industry and that's basically what I'm saying here. I've got kind of this S, I, R type model. So just a three compartment model that I've built into this sector. And I can even simulate this thing independently once I get like all the variables connected here. And then I forget about that sector for a second. And then I zoom in on the housing sector and I say, okay, what are the variables that might matter in housing? And again, I can come up with a compartmental model, something that keeps track of where things are in their kind of age structure. And so I start out with premium housing. So this is the, you know, things are born in the premium, premium housing. And then that matures into housing that is not quite so premium anymore. So the people that had a lot of money to spend, uh, maybe these become cheaper and they go off and, and go into new premium housing and these things age into worker housing. And then eventually these worker housing age into um, further uh, decline. And so maybe they come even cheaper and, um, uh, yeah, oh, sorry, yeah, sick, infected, recovered, or sick, infectious, recovered. So I like to emphasize infectious because it shows that you can spread the infection, but um, infected is often also used as well because usually when you're infected, you're infectious, but you might be infectious when you're not showing symptoms. So sometimes that's why you need the distinction. Uh, yeah, thanks for the great, I really appreciate you guys commenting and helping each other in the chat. That's really awesome. Uh, and so, um, so now we've got a similar structured model here for housing. So, um, but you can see it's got new flows coming in. So, it, so this is like a modified SIR model where you could imagine this middle com uh, compartment, um, there are additional ways to get these um, this, uh, things into this middle compartment. Similarly, there are additional ways to get things into the under this unemployed thing. So it's almost like there's this here, this is how you create premium housing. And you, your premium housing will naturally age into worker housing, but you're also going to have people that are going to build worker housing uh, out front. And then likewise, you're going to build uh, underemployed housing as well out front, but then also the worker housing is going to mature into that. So we're getting kind of an idea of how we model the dynamics of just this sector. And then we've got one last sector we can focus on. And again, we just come up with compartments that kind of do the bookkeeping here. And now we're modeling at the level of people, population. And at the level of the people, then um, we've got um, our uh, managerial professionals. So um, the f and so we've got kind of a uh, flows are going in multiple directions here. So things have gotten kind of really exciting in this sector, and that you can kind of imagine that you know there for the most part people start as workers. There are a couple that start as managers. Maybe they come from uh, elsewhere, 
and there are, um, and then there's a bunch that start as underemployed. And in general, the worker population and underemployed population, they're kind of like an SIS model. So they keep trading back and forth. And so um, workers stay employed and then they might become unemployed or underemployed and then they get new jobs and they become employed. But eventually some of those workers become managerial professionals up here and we're not modeling their decline back into workers we kind of assume that if they become managerials they're finally have been latched in and they're going to be employed for the rest of time and so that's the way we're modeling um, you know an exchange between unemployment and work but then once you um, uh, or end up elevating into management then you stay in management for the rest of your life that's the way this is being modeled here so we've got these dynamics that we've modeled in these um, three sectors, and we can then zoom out and then figure out how do they interact with each other. And so we can see that like managerial professionals here, you know, they um, may be the ones that uh, are, you know, maybe the managerial pro professionals are the ones that are going to be using the premium housing. Or, um, you know, so uh, maybe the new enterprises, with new enterprises, you're going to end up getting more premium housing and more managerial professionals. So you can imagine that uh, you've got um, all of these different ways that you can uh, have these different variables affecting each other. And that's what you're building this coordinating network, which is modeling those effects. And that's just kind of, you know, without going into all of the details here, that's what we're trying to model. So we started with a CLD. We then came up with um, three sectors. We put stocks in those sectors. And then we figured out how to connect all of the stocks together, uh, mainly in between the sectors, but then also across the sectors. So that's kind of a process you'd like to do and to model in your own. So we started with this dynamic hypothesis over here, and we ended up with a simulation. The simulation is our prediction. If this hypothesis over here is correct, then this simulation will generate predictions that match our data. So our simulation is just trying to generate predictions that follow from our hypothesis that it's all about infrastructure centrally, and that interacts with a lot of other variables that we can measure in the city. So what happens when we simulate this? Then we end up getting curves that look like this. This is simulated data. And so they were able to plot um, all of these different variables that they could measure inside their simulation. And, um, and so you get these cool plots, but the kind of common feature in these plots is this growth and uh, stagnation. And so we can then compare that with um, this model over here. And so this model models that, uh, you know, in about 150 years, you get about 150 years of growth. So there's our 150 years of growth and then stagnation. And what's cool about the model that we see on the right, the simulation model, is using similar variables that they could find data about um, with regards to how quickly you can build things in Boston, for example, et cetera, et cetera. If you take all of those variables from real data, from a real city, and you put them into the simulation, not only do you get the right shape where you get urban growth followed by stagnation, but it even has a similar time scale. So notice that in about 150 years after you start the simulation, you reach the peak. The same way after about 150 years here, you reach the peak. So this really gives us some evidence that this idea that infrastructure is what is really driving these growth dynamics, that hypothesis seems to really be very explanatory. There may be other things that are modulating it, but we could probably make an argument that this infrastructure hypothesis is, um, is really important if you want to think about the growth of a city. So the growth of a city is tied to its infrastructure. That's what the argument they're trying to make and support here. So, um, so just in summary, and then I'll ask for some questions, what we've demonstrated here uh, abstractly is a way to start out with a dynamic hypothesis that was um, shown as a CLD. And then from that dynamic hypothesis, we could choose stocks and flows, and that um, helps us build our simulation. And then from those stocks and flows, we create a coordinating network, and we use our 
causal loop diagram or our dynamic hypothesis to guide our choices in building these formulas in the coordinating network. And then from there, we can actually simulate. And that simulation ends up testing the dynamic hypothesis because we can compare the simulation output to reality. And if they match, then that validates our simulation and it gives support to our dynamic hypothesis. Now, once we have support for this dynamic hypothesis, if we have a good idea that we can say our simulation actually is a good model of our city, we could start testing, we could iterate and test additional hypotheses. What if I add a bunch more land? How quickly can I get my city to regrow? It might be that in the social loop, that people are so, that the city has become so unattractive that it takes forever for new development to actually reinvigorate the growth in the city. And you could go and test that by going in and building that onto your model. So that's kind of an example of how to go through this process in modeling the, uh, of the complexities of a city. Do we have questions about that or reflections on this and how, um, how it was set up in the chapter? By the way, the, I, I realize that I may have the background behind me, I think is, um, is, a, is a group of ants from my laboratory. I think it's still on there. So uh, I happen to work on the way, um, what, some of the things I work on are how ants solve things in groups. And so we have these ants that build these bridges out of their bodies, speaking of infrastructure. So they're able to actually um, build infrastructure out of their own bodies. So you can imagine how that changes the causal loop diagram when people become part of the infrastructure. Right. Yeah, and you could you could say that this uh, this bridge is a type of emergent property. Uh, uh, the ants are doing local rules, but then suddenly you back up and you see this structure that forms that becomes useful to the other ants. These are uh, called weaver ants, um, or uh, it's Echophila smaragdina is the genus and species. Um, uh, where's the species name? They're an Australian ant. So um, these were collected in Australia and then brought to Arizona to do local experiments on them. Other people work on these ants as well. Um, and uh, so sometimes they're called green weaver ants or green tree ants. Um, they actually have um, a a, uh, in their gaster, there's a, their formic acid, it, it's enhanced to have like a lime taste. So you can lick their butts and it tastes like a lime. Um, so much so that people down in Australia actually make a ceviche out of it and they season margaritas with it because they're just everywhere in the city. So you can just find trees. So you can walk around throughout the city and you find them on trees and you can grab a bunch of them and then you can effectively juice them um, it, it for this formic acid and then, you know, use it in these different culinary ways. Yeah, they're all over in Queensland. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. And they weave leaves together. So they actually can uh, build these chains like the one you see behind me um, to, to take a leaf that's flat and curve it around. And then they use silk from their larvae, kind of like a cocoon. Uh, but instead of cocooning the larvae, they use silk to hold the leaves together. So they're able to actually weave leaves into balls. They're like rugby by sized uh, balls. And then they live inside those. So you look up in the trees and you see a bunch of these rugby balls that have been weaved together with silk. And that's what they live in. So it's kind of cool. Um, professor, I have a question more related towards uh, this. <laughs> sure, that sounds great. Sorry, but that was that was interesting. Um, uh -huh. So when we're doing our presentations, do we discuss kind of our um, process of getting to how we got our final um, CLD model and answer our dynamic hypothesis? Like, do we show our sketch of our um, sectors, then do our CLD, and then show the class how we figured out our stock and flow with our formulas? Think of your audience for your, this is not the presentation due Sunday. If you haven't like gotten your check for that, that's just like a quick, you know, two minute thing to just show me that you're, you're working in VinSim or Insight Maker. The thing due at the end of the month um, is think of your stakeholders as, think of your audience as stakeholders who aren't the class. Like they're not, it's not educational. It's meant to be making an argument about your system. And so however best you make that argument, so you probably are gonna say, um, here's the thing that we're trying to test. In order to test it, we broke, uh, we built a model and the model had these components because you wanna make me as a stakeholder trust your model. 
And so, um, so you could imagine something similar to what I just talked about, but maybe less educational. So it might be like, oh, so we modeled, um, you know, we modeled housing, we modeled, uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever the three ones, housing, uh, people, and I forget what the other thing was. And in each one of these, we kept track of, um, you know, these key components. You're not going to want to give every detail because you only have, I forget, 12 or 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, so, but just enough to kind of be able to, to bring the reader or the, the stakeholder on board to understand what you're talking about and then show the simulation results and then, then use the simulation results to make an argument to say, we originally thought this when we went into the simulation, but then after the simulation, these results were actually counter to our predictions, which makes us think that maybe we were wrong. And so because we were wrong, that tells us that this other thing is going on. That's like one example of an argument you could make. Um, okay, like say for example, I know I talk about my project sometimes and for my group project, but if we're modeling plastic and the hyper consumption of it, do we match our results like a hypothesis with actual data? Like when plastic barely came into existence, a lot of people were using it because it was cheap and all this. So do we have to match it with um, research that we do to like, actually prove what we're simulating is correct. Well, we'll talk a little bit about validation. So I think in the next chapter, that's where we talk about like boundary adequacy and mm -hmm. validation and all that sort of stuff. So, and there are different ways to validate. And so okay. if uh, the, what you definitely want to start with wherever possible, you want to try to find parameters in your model that you can match to parameters mm -hmm. from the real world where you can't find that you, what you can do is just come up with a number for a parameter. And if you think uh, that you're, you might be way off in that parameter, you can then simulate for a much larger and a much smaller value of that parameter and see if it changes any of your results. And if it okay. doesn't change them much, then you can say, and I actually don't need to find a good number for this because this, the, you know, for a wide range of parameters it works. Or if it does change it a lot, you can say that we're going to assume this value but because our model is so sensitive to this parameter, it's important in future research to go out and find out if this parameter is higher than this or lower than this or something like that. Um, that's one way to go, but that's kind of saying that you've already sold me on the structure of your model. If the structure of your model is what's under question, then you may need to run your model and then generate some trajectories and then kind of convince me from those trajectories that because the model generated trajectories that made sense, then I can trust the model. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions? I just use the ant aside to give people time to think. I was uh, I was kind of curious about the sectors that you mentioned. You broke up the system into to help kind of answer your dynamic your dynamic hypothesis. Um, <clears throat> so, would we all need to each of our groups kind of have to have three sectors like that, or could we have less sectors, more? Uh, I can't, I can't tell you exactly how many sectors you're going to have, but I would say that um, if you, that a, a model that's like good at the project level will probably be complex enough that you're going to want to create at least two sectors. So you, you, in order for it to kind of be like worthy for simulation, you want to have like enough variables that it's difficult to see what's going to happen. And usually if you only have like one sector's worth, whatever that is of variables, that might be like two stocks. You can kind of guess what's probably going to happen ahead of time. So, um, so in sectors are kind of just a logic, like it might be that this sector uh, or organization doesn't really help you. And like you could say, I could just come up with seven stocks and wire them together. And I don't need sectors to break this thing up. And my seven stocks are complicated enough. And uh, when we talk about chaos, which will be like in two lectures from now, you'll see that you can actually build very complex systems with very few stocks. And so um, it, it, what I'm really looking for is enough complexity that it makes sense to use a simulation, not like a critical number of sectors. And if sectors helps you with that, that's great. If it doesn't help you, um, don't worry about it. Does that help? Oh uh, yeah, that definitely definitely makes sense. Could I, could I ask you like, ask if like so would the economic impact on cities be a sector they be, could be looked at for like fires um damaging like for forest fire spread well i would say like if you were doing like forest fires in a city then maybe you've got um your sectors might be you know um something to do with um 
the kind of natural environment, like the, you know, how does the, the dryness, the humidity, the amount of forest, you know, those sorts of like natural resource things, that might be one sector, a natural resources sector. And then another sector might be um, city development. And so, and these two interact because the more city you have, maybe the less natural resources. And then what you might find is that with the less natural resources, you get, um, you know, more ability for a fire to spread in the city or something like that. So maybe those two make sense as two separate sectors, but um, but maybe it, maybe you end up if if like you you call a sector something that's just a single stock and another sector just a single stock, it probably wasn't that useful to break them up into two separate sectors. You probably could have just considered them one big sector. But so long as there's enough complexity that like if you're that the answer to your question isn't obvious before you run the simulation, then I'm okay with it. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, let's move on because there is a couple of other things to cover. And I think this next example may be helpful thinking about your final projects as well. So, um, so now fishery dynamics and regulatory products. So let's take the fisheries model we've been working on and then add in policy dynamics because i think a lot of you are going to be doing something like this especially if you're you just talk about natural resource and then the consumers of that resource and then the policy arm like three different sectors and we'll see that in this example and they kind of went through that in this chapter so this is our old fishery uh model um you know we keep track of how many fish we have uh there's a fish density that we calculate that generates a regeneration rate which gives us new fish and then that gives us our logistic growth and so uh, there's our logistic growth model, grows, saturates, um, you know, actually similar to the um, urban dynamics model we just saw. And we know that this is mainly driven by this net regeneration lookup table right here, which has a um, upward sloping part and a downward sloping part. And the upward sloping part plays the role of a reinforcing loop or turns the loop into a reinforcing loop. So when there's few fish, that feedback loop is reinforcing. But then once you get to many fish, that's in close to carrying capacity, that feedback loop becomes balancing. So we're going to now think about this lookup table and how it affects how we manage this fisheries. So if we think about this lookup table, which just takes our fish density as an input, and it takes the regeneration rate of the fish of the output, then we see that if the fish are at this density here and we fish them so that we decrease their density so that now they hop to this density here, it actually, for these two densities, so the density, the original density, which is here on the right, and the, the other density, which is here in the middle, that actually causes the regeneration rate to be low. So down here, the regeneration rate per fish is relatively low because with all the fish, it's hard for each fish to find food. So per fish, the regeneration rate is low, even though the population is large. When you call that population, when you reduce the numbers of that population, it actually makes it so that each fish left over now actually has more access to resources, its own food. And so that means that the regeneration rate per fish goes up. So this is actually good for thinking about harvesting this fishery because you're able to harvest a little bit and the fishery will naturally bounce back. So fishing leads to better conditions for more fishing. But the problem is eventually once the fish uh, at low densities, you get the opposite effect. So at a low density, if you started at this density here, the fish are regenerating at a high rate, but um, but they now they're on this part of the slope where now they're more limited by um well now it's it's kind of the, the exponential growth part of the slope where um where right now they're not food limited and because they're not food limited then the more fish you get the more fish offspring you get because every fish kind of has the maximal number of offspring so if you want the maximal regeneration rate you get you just generate large numbers of fish so on the opposite side the more fish you get, the more food limited they are. But on this side, they're not food limited. And because they're not food limited, the more fish you get, the more new fish you get. So it's a positive feedback loop. The downside of being on this side of the curve is that if you fish, if you start at the density that is uh, up here, down here, 
that gives you a high regeneration rate. But as you fish them, it shrinks the densities so that now there's less fish. Well, with less fish, there's less new fish. So the regeneration rate goes down. So now more fishing actually leads to a runaway process where more fishing makes it worse to fish. And so if you don't stop fishing, you end up basically driving things to extinction. And so we can think of it as like the portion above, you know, in this downward sloping part, that's kind of like in the bank. You, you put a certain amount of money in the bank. If you only spend your interest, then that money that you originally put in the bank stays in the bank and you end up not ever taking out of your principal. But on the other side of the curve, what you're basically saying is I've now not only spent my interest, but I've actually started to spend my principal. And there's still money in the bank, so I can keep spending it. But eventually, if I just keep spending and spending and spending, my principal is going to go to zero. So that's why we'd like to spend our interest. We'd like to spend the new fish and not the old fish. But once you've reached a critical density, then that critical density says that every new fish you take out, you're taking out a principal and not interest. You're spending the old fish. So that critical density is something that is called a tipping point. And we'll define what they mean by that here in a couple of slides. And it's related to this maximum sustainable yield that uh, is the question that people have asked about in the previous lectures. So let's think about this tipping point and how it affects the dynamics of this thing as we go, uh, you know, if we think about this whole model. So now we've put the we've put the harvesting into like a kind of a harvesting sector uh, into the model. And so here are all of our model parameters. So you guys have seen this one, you've simulated this yourself in a homework. And uh, we've got our, um, our regeneration rate with our tipping point down here, which is encoded by this net regeneration graph here. And so if we think about this and we simulate this going forward, this here, three is the number of, uh, well, so the number of ships is four. So that's the number of ships here. And the amount of fish that all of the ships are taking out as a team is this three here. So this is the actual uh, harvest rate. So we've got our, we're, you know, we're harvesting at this rate with this number of ships down here. And what we see is that even though we started at 4,000 ships, um, Oh, sorry, I saw this question here. In the reading, I was confused about what the difference between fish stock and fish density. Good question. Um, fish stock is the absolute number of fish. Fish density is the absolute number of fish divided by the total number of fish possible. So a fish stock of 4,000 is equal to a fish density of 1.0. So that's our density. And so it's just a rescaling of fish stock, given that you're assuming you know what the um, what the, the carrying capacity is. So fish stock divided by carrying capacity. Does that make it clear? Hopefully so. So the um, so the fish density is just um, just makes it easier to draw that regeneration rate curve, so that we can make the x-axis from zero to one instead of from zero to four thousand. All right, so um, we, our actual fish stock starts at a density of one, or it starts at carrying capacity. As we start harvesting it, then it declines, but it reaches a steady state value. Yes, but why is it harder to regenerate with a higher fish density? So if you're at, if you're at carrying capacity, which is a density of 1.0, 4,000 fish, what that means is that, yes, Brandy mentioned resources, that's right. So if that you are there a carrying capacity of 4,000 fit good all right so it sounds like so sorry Emily's question but for anybody else who had that question um, there are only enough resources to support 4,000 fish so at 4,000 fish the 4,001 fish the first offspring it, it can't find any food all the food's gone so if you decrease the number of fish you're implicitly increasing the food available so that you new fish don't have to starve so that's why you don't want to be at carrying capacity in a society, in a population. So as you know, on Earth, we might know the carrying capacity for humans is X. The last thing we want is a planet where there are X number of humans, because that means the X plus one human is guaranteed to die. 
um, and the ex-humans um, are living a terrible life. So you don't ever want to be at carrying capacity. That's why it actually can be good to harvest these natural resources because um, you don't necessarily want them to be sitting at carrying capacity. So um, the so this right now with this number of boats we are at a sustainable outcome. It's sustainable because this leveled off, the, the fish stock leveled off. And the other way to look at it is the harvest rate um, and the regeneration rate uh, are equal. So the regeneration rate was able to rise to the harvest rate and when they met together, that meant we're at a sustainable outcome. We can fuel that. So then, um, given that we're at a sustainable outcome, the fishing industry decides they want to put more uh, boats out. So they increase the number of boats, which is going to increase the harvest rate. So this increase in harvest rate is met with a decrease in fish population. But fortunately, uh, the fish increase their regeneration rate and they're able to compensate. And so the regeneration rate of the fish increases and then it levels out. So another sustainable outcome. The question is how far can this go? And so that is where, where we get back into this care or this um, maximum sustainable yield question. At what point will fish reproduction not be able to match this harvest size? And so we go back to our curve here and we think about this dynamic process. We start at some density with some regeneration rate. We end up fishing and that ends up um, reducing. Uh, so at this point, if we fish more, we are going to fish more than the fish can regenerate. And this difference between how much we're taking out and how much are being put back in is going to cause the density to shift. And it's going to shift until it balances out. And so when it balances out, then we reach a new density, which will be lower than the original density, but at least we now match the harvest rate. So then we keep doing this. So we put more boats in the fishery, that causes the catch rate to go higher. So now our harvest rate is higher. That has a deficit here. So that causes the fishery to shrink even more. And with the shrinking fishery, then we end up getting, you know, we end up getting a lower density. And at this density, that's kind of the most that we can do. So at this density, we can balance out. But if we add any more fish that are fishing, then we are going to shrink the um, the fishery, but the shrinking of the fishery is not going to result in a higher regeneration rate. And that's the problem. And so if we continue to fish, we're just going to shrink the fishery. That's going to make the regeneration rate even lower, which creates even bigger deficits, which is going to cause an even larger reduction so that the fishery goes more and more until you end up hitting extinction. And the crazy thing about that is even if you go back to the old number of boats, so, um, so you could go down, you could say, oh shoot, you know, I don't want the fish to go extinct. I remember that back when we had four boats, everything was fine. So let's just go back to having four boats. But now you're in a new part of the system where even though four boats might've had this catch rate, because you're stuck way over here, your regeneration rate is still less than the, what the original four boats. So you originally had a situation that could sustain four boats, but because you've gone over this so-called tipping point, the system is now in a position where it can't even support four boats anymore. So the system has flipped, it is tipped into a totally new dynamic where you actually have to basically remove all boats in order to cause the system to bounce back. And only after you wait for the system to bounce back can you put your four boats back in. That's why you don't want to cross these tipping points, because these tipping points mean that you can't easily go back to a previously sustainable uh, configuration. You may have to go, uh, it may be really, really hard. Like, you know, you could actually think of COVID-19. We could probably model um, the reaction of, say, policymakers um, if they don't react quick enough then if they react really quickly, then maybe you can actually reduce the length of the infection. But if you wait long enough, even if you do react very strongly later, once uh, things are out of the barn, then um, there's no going back. So it's a, you know, it's, you're stuck. 
Um, what other systems are sensitive to tipping points? Um, I'll give some examples of that. That's, an, that's coming up in another slide here. Excellent question. Um, so for the fishery, this tipping point is related to this thing called a maximum sustainable yield. The maximum sustainable yield, it sounds like it should be, you know, the, on this axis, on the y-axis, but the maximum sustainable yield is usually defined as the density corresponding to the, regener the maximum regeneration rate. So the maximum sustainable yield is usually about half of the carrying capacity. So it is the size of the population that corresponds to its maximum rate of increase. Typically, it's roughly half the carrying capacity. And so um, if we can estimate the number of fish in the fishery, then we can hopefully be able to, um, to see how close we are to the maximum sustainable yield. And as we get closer and closer and closer to it, then we can maybe ramp up policy so that we pre prevent ourselves from going over it. Because once we go over it, we've gone over that tipping point and we might be in a lot of uh, trouble. So that's our MSY. So then that brings us back to our dynamics to say, what's gonna happen here? So if we increase our number of boats, because that's what we've always been able to do, we've always been able to increase the number of boats, then that's gonna increase the harvest rate, finally to a point where the regeneration rate cannot keep up. And at that point, we're gonna get massive population declines, which we see here. So the population declines, and as does the regeneration rate. And as the regeneration, date, uh, date, regeneration rate declines, then the problem with our excess harvesting make, becomes even, even worse. And so um, even if we go back to the original number of boats, which was the originally sustainable harvest rate, then our regeneration rate is still too low that it can't keep up and, our, and we end up, the fishery goes into extinction. And so um, that's kind of an example that we cannot res rescue sustainability with the old number of boats. The only thing we can do is pretty much remove all boats from the fishery and wait for the fish stocks to replenish so that we've got, you know, our principal gets replenished in our bank account. And once we have that principal back, then we can start spending the interest again. So that's kind of how these fisheries work. And that's what this MSY is all about. It's the density that corresponds to this maximum regeneration rate. And it is what we refer to as a tipping point of this system. And so the system reached its tipping point at this point in time. And so that's what, um, if you're observing it externally, you may not have even realized it, but when the system flipped from that, it's a scary thing because you didn't realize the system that happened. And so you think you could have um, simply just changed your policy, but the dynamics change after so that your old policies don't work anymore. So you don't want to stress a system to go over a tipping point because you might mean you need totally different understanding of how to work in the system after the tipping point. So that's all we're kind of saying there. So um, I want to sort of um, now introduce, but before I do that, I'm going to ask for questions, but I want to now introduce a graphical element that we use to help us diagram how these tipping points work in these systems that we can get out of running our simulations for a bunch of different scenarios and then use those to summarize all these other scenarios at once. But before I get to that, are there any questions about this tipping point or this maximum sustainable yield? I'm sure some of these terms you've seen in your other classes. Hopefully this provides more dynamic understanding. All right, okay. So let's, so what I wanna summarize now is this cool thing that wasn't mentioned in your chapter, but if you learned how to read these, um, they may become useful for those of you who wanna go off and, and uh, study these dynamical systems in the future. So this is what's called a bifurcation diagram. And this is a graphical depiction about how possible steady state outcomes change with some important parameter. And so I've got, fish population up here and I'm actually going to model this the the long term steady state value so in the past we've plotted how the fish population changes over time 
And then eventually it settles out at a level and that level might be zero if, it is, if things go extinct or that level might be 4,000 if they're at uh, carrying capacity. So we're not focused on the short time scale. We're not focused on the transients. We're focused on whatever level do they, steady, they, do they settle out at on the kind of right hand side of those behavior over time plots. And we're, and we're interested in how a parameter that is an input to the system like harvest rate affects these steady states. So this helps us tell at, at what point have we reached a critical harvest rate and at what harvest rates help us rescue the system if we have to. So if we think about these steady state parameters, so um, again, what the term I mean by parameter here, this is a term which basically then means a variable that for all intents and purposes, in your model is constant or it is very slow changing as opposed to all the other variables in your system that are changing over time. And so harvest rate we view as an input to the system. That's what I'm calling, calling it a, a parameter. And so then we have a dynamical variable, which is our fish stock, which does change over time, but I'm focused only on its steady state value. So I'm focusing on the right hand side of the behavior over time plot. So if I've got my behavior over time plot and my fish stock does this, I'm interested in the value at which it, um, it levels out at. So this value right here. And so for every parameter, I've got a different set of steady state values that are possible. And that's what I'm plotting here. So um, that's what I'm just saying in this bifurcation diagrams. So the idea here is I pick a harvest rate. Let's say I pick this one down here. And I look at my um, net regeneration curve for the fisheries model. That's how I determine this here. And I see that for this harvest rate, there are two net regeneration rates that bring the system into balance. So there's this one that corresponds to a lower density. And then there's this one over here that corresponds to a higher density. And so I need to keep track of those two. Now, what's different between those two? Well, I know that if I'm at this density over here, this lower density, if I add one more fish to the system, but I hold the harvest rate here, then at that point, I'm, my fish are going to regenerate at a rate that is higher than the harvest rate, and that will cause them to grow. And so they will then rush away from this density. So if they're at this density, they stay there in balance. But if they, if I, if they manage to just randomly get one other fish, then that, uh, that causes growth because they can now produce at a rate higher than the catch rate. And that then um, allows them to grow and potentially then go to the other side of this curve. Now on the flip side of that, if you reduce if you start at this density and you remove one fish because you're harvesting them, then that's going to cause them to not be able to keep up with this harvest rate. And that's gonna cause them to decline. And they will decline all the way down to the point where they go extinct. So I have to consider this extinction as another steady state value because we know that if there are no fish in the fishery, um, then I know that it, it will hold that value forever, regardless of what we care the harvest rate originally was. And so a harvest rate here may still result in extinction. So I have to consider this third point as well. So I'm going to call this balancing point an unstable point. It's unstable because if you add one fish or reduce one fish, it stops being able to stay in balance. Now to contrast that, if I'm the other side of the curve, if I'm at this fish density, then if I reduce the number of fish, that's so that would be moving in this direction, then I actually get an increased regeneration rate. And that increased regeneration rate is going to then add back the fish that I've taken out. Similarly, if I manage to, if somebody dumps more fish in, then that dumping of more fish in is going to reduce their regeneration rate and that will then bring them back. So this point here, I'm going to call a stable balance point or a stable equilibrium point. So this one is unstable and this one is stable. And actually the extinction point is also stable because if you add just one fish in the extinction case, that one fish is gonna quickly die because it's gonna be uh, harvested out. So we've got stable, unstable, and stable. 
And so I now need to just, uh, so that's what I'm just saying here, that the extinction is also stable. So I'm going to take these three points and I am going to plot these stable, unstable, and stable all on a line corresponding to the harvest rate. So this harvest rate has these three points connected to it. And you can imagine that if I redid that analysis as I sweep my, my fish or my harvest rate um, back this way and back this way, then these three points that I plotted here are going to move according to this shape. And so this shape here, this thick black line is the harvest rate curve. I just basically took this, I'm sorry, the regeneration curve. It's basically just a regeneration curve rotated to fit on this other axis here. And so um, what I can do is I can, I know that this top line are all going to be stable equilibria. I know that these, this middle line are all going to be unstable equilibria and this bottom line are all going to be stable equilibria. So I'm just going to label them differently so that the stable ones are solid, the unstable ones are broken, and so I end up getting this picture right here. And so this picture is a, is a concise summary of the long-term dynamics of the fishery for every possible harvest rate. So at low harvest rates down here, then I know that if I start with um, a population that is in this region up here, and then I start harvesting at this ray here, then I know that the population will end up going to whatever equilibrium point on this upper curve um, corresponds to the point down here. But then if instead I was at this harvest rate and I had really very few fish in the fishery, then, um, then what that tells me is that if there's, I started out with this number of fish in the fishery, then that's actually going to cause my fishery to go extinct. So, um, so what we're seeing is that if for all of these harvest rates here, if your initial number of fish are above the dashed line, then they are going to rush to the stable points on this solid blue line, which we view as sustainable outcomes. So that we are going to be able to stabilize a non-zero population of fish for all of these harvest rates, so long as the fish population starts above this dashed line. Now, if we pick a harvest rate and the fish population for that harvest rate is below that dashed line, then that's going to tell us that actually what's going to happen is if you start below the dashed line for this harvest rate, then that's going to cause the fish population to go extinct. It's because the at that point you're closer to the you're to the stable extinction equilibria. And the scary point is that there is a region that only a region of harvest rates that is only unstable. So what this tells me is that for these really high harvest rates, then that basically means there is no way I can have a sustainable outcome for this high of a harvest rate. And so the tipping point is the point that delineates the region where you at least have sustainable outcomes possible and the region where there are no sustainable outcomes possible. And the scary thing about these tipping points is you can move from the blue region here into this red region, which will push you way down here, which means that even if you restore your harvest rate to a previously sustainable version, you might still be in this red region. And you actually have to go much, much farther to get back into the blue region. And when you're in this blue region, then things will finally go back up to a point that's sustainable again. So I'm just going to show that in kind of cartoon form here. We start at this in the blue region at that harvest rate. And we reach um, equilibrium. We reach a sustainable outcome. And then um, we decide to um, increase our harvest rate. But we increase it so much that we go over the tipping point and our population declines. And so our new steady state population is now low. Now we freak out and we enact regulations and we bring the number of boats back. And so we go back to what was previously a sustainable policy.
but it turns out we're still in the red region. And so our fish population continues to decline. So the only thing we can do is actually bring the number of boats way, way down so that there's hardly any boats out there anymore, maybe none. And then finally, we break back into the blue region, which brings us back up to near carrying capacity fish after a long period of time. So we have to really wait for that. And then we can start harvesting. And, we, and only then can we go back to our old harvest rate, which will then bring us back to the old fish population where we started. So we had a small change in harvest rate, pushed us over the tipping point, and required a large change in harvest rate to bring us back. And this property of a small change in one direction requiring a large change to get us back is a property we call hysteresis. And so systems that have hysteresis are systems that are, hysteresis means a dependence on history. And so you can, um, where you are in the system um, is only partly important as to where you've been before. And so in this case, knowing your harvest rate isn't enough. You have to know um, what the fish stock is. In other words, you kind of have to know that that um, that am I at am I harvest if I'm harvesting at this rate down here, am I starting at a point at which I've started with enough fish to sustain that rate, or am I starting at a point where I don't have enough fish to sustain that rate? And so the history, your history with the fishery, depends or tells you whether you can sustain this harvest rate and how you can bring the fishery back into sustainability. So um, we can now generalize to sort of answering Jordan's question. So are there, before I do that, are there any questions about this diagram, this bifurcation diagram, what it means? Could you just put that um, caption box back in about hysteresis? I was writing notes. And sure. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, and I'm, I'm sorry, Emily, I missed your question before. So you said you're confused again on how the, the density is still increasing after the regeneration decreases um, from the tipping point. So uh, the, the, the density only, so the, after you increase the harvest rate, increasing the harvest rate is always gonna decrease the density. But if you then decrease the harvest rate to the point at which fish can start reproducing again, then the regeneration rate will end up increasing the density again. I'm not sure if that answers your question, um, the, but the density can only increase after we've restored, after we've made the harvest rate get extremely low because what we're basically saying is as the population sinks the regeneration rate is going to sink and so we need to move the harvest rate to under that regeneration rate okay good i'm glad yeah great i'm sorry i didn't catch that question earlier any other questions all right and then I hope you can see potentially how you could use it. Most people generate these bifurcation diagrams using mathematical expressions, but it, you can generate them with your simulation too. You can run your simulations for like 15 different um, uh, harvest rates and then plot and then uh, several different initial conditions for each harvest rate. And then that basically allows you to map out what happens for every initial condition harvest rate pair. And then you can end up actually figuring out um, an estimate of this, um, of this curve, of this bifurcation diagram. Other systems that demonstrate hysteresis, I mean, there are, um, there are a ton of them. And so uh, I, I, sometimes they're, they're psychological. So some people make as an example of like, so if you lived in a region of the world that got cold, then you find that people decide to put on their jackets at different temperatures depending on what the temperature was before. So um, if, um, so let's just say that it is summer. And so you might be 
you might not be willing to commit to winter. And so you, um, you stay in your summer clothes for, a, a, you know, for temperatures as they get really, really low. Um, and then eventually at some breaking point, you say, shoot, I'm gonna switch to winter clothes. Now, you, your winter clothes, you don't switch back to summer clothes at that same temperature. You might switch back to summer clothes at a different temperature. And so that idea that where you were beforehand changes when you switch is hysteresis. Any system where you can't uniformly say that here's a parameter, temperature, and above that temperature, you're wearing this outfit, and below that temperature, you're wearing the other outfit. The instant you say it depends, like it's, uh, it's 65 degrees out, what are you gonna wear? You can say, well, if I was in the summer, if I was in the summer and it got 65 degrees, I'm gonna still wear my summer clothes. Um, but if I was in the winter and it was 65 degrees, um, I'll be still wearing my winter clothes. And so that suggests that you're latched into your clothing choices. It's not just purely dependent on the number of the temperature. And we'll see some other examples that have hysteresis as well in the next couple of slides. All right, so, um, so let's think about tipping points and hysteresis and just getting our, our, our minds wrapped around <clears throat> where this term comes from. Um, the tipping point idea is um, is this idea that a like if uh, uh, I might actually skip these sides. Is there anybody who has a specific? So the the idea behind tipping points is that you're. But for time, I might skip these tipping point slides. I actually have a video online that is actually this slice of the lecture anyway, um, and I might just want to skip ahead to the kind of more kind of sustainability relevant ones. But but I hope the idea behind a tipping point is a little bit clearer. Is that the the refrigerator acts a certain way as you bump into it when it's in this configuration. But if you manage to tip the refrigerator over, then at this point, you're never gonna get the refrigerator back up unless you really crank it over into a different angle. And so this is the idea of a tipping point is that you've got and uh, that that you can kind of wiggle things for a while, but if you push them a little far and they tip over, then then you actually have to wiggle them a lot farther to get them to tip back up. And you can actually have irreversibility associated with that. So if you spill the wine, so that's where this term came from, thinking about a wine glass, is that once the wine is spilt, even if you can manage to tip the wine glass back up, you can't get the wine back in the wine glass. And so you've done the damage. It's, it's permanently you know, irreversible. And so, the worry is that there's a bunch of dynamical systems and so here are a bunch that have been proposed that have tipping points and so these are tipping points with respect to temperature and so the worry is that as you make temperature hotter and hotter and hotter then a bunch of these systems so each one of them are kind of provided here in circles may have these tipping points where they are going to <clears throat> reach a point where they are going to be unable to sustain themselves. And the downside is even if we cool things down, they're not gonna go back to how they were unless we freeze things out or maybe it's just permanently changed. So that's the scary thing about tipping points is once you go over the tipping points, like once you melt, once you melt all of the ice, making it cold again doesn't mean the ice is gonna go back. And if it does go back, it may not go back to where it was. So, so you can kind of like to answer the question about what are the other tipping points. Here's just a, a, a sample of examples. Um, and, uh, and then it turns out I mean, there's been whole books. So Malcolm Gladwell made a lot of money off of this book, The Tipping Point. So it's a very popular topic. And um, you see it in climate change. You see it in political instability. So you can piss off people in your country um, and they'll tolerate it up to a point. And then once, and then eventually they try to revolt. Now, when they start revolt, you know, rebelling, if you then step back and you give them what they wanted, it may not be enough. So that's an example of hysteresis where um, they were willing to tolerate it up to a point and then you flipped them into a different state. And when they were into that state, giving them what they originally wanted isn't enough because their history matters and you have to give them a whole lot more. Or maybe they're just, they're just going to, there's gonna be a revolution. Um, similarly, attitudes and social norms, there can be good tipping points. And so you can convince people that it's not good to shake hands, for example, um, because you can spread disease. And it might take something like COVID-19, 
But then once COVID-19 goes away, maybe people don't shake hands anymore. And maybe that's an example of a good tipping point. And then you could probably come up with others. And so uh, this is there's a rich literature on these tipping points. All right. Uh, well, I mean, so if there's a question is life and death tipping points. So um, tipping points are, are thought of as parameters. And so they're there. So death is um, is irreversible, but we don't usually think of time as a parameter. We think of like um, sugar intake as a parameter. So diabetes is an example. The onset of diabetes, that's a tipping point. So if you, um, so the, you know, so for like type two diabetes, you, um, you might, if your sugar intake increases to the point where once you get diabetes, you can't get rid of that diabetes. And so you can go back to, you might've had a healthy life, life or a, a low sugar lifestyle. You increase your sugar lifestyle. Now you have type two diabetes. If you go back to a low sugar lifestyle, you still have diabetes. And so you're stuck with it. And so that is an example of a physiological tipping point that you can't undo. Um, and so once you get diabetes, you might have to just cut all sugar from your diet. <coughs> um, a midlife crisis could um, be an example of, of you going through a tipping point. But a midlife crisis, the time you go through the tipping we wouldn't call that the tipping point. The tipping point is the parameter value. So, um, a, a, so a midlife crisis is a symptom of a tipping point. So you might say, man, the conditions at work got so bad it pushed me over the edge. And after that point, even though things got better at work, I just couldn't take it anymore. And so that's an example that you were pushed over a tipping point. So we don't review, view tipping points as times. We review tipping points as parameters, as, as environmental variables, that if you change too much, they push you over. And if you change the variable back, it doesn't, you don't go back. And that is an indication you went over a tipping point. <clears throat> great, great. Okay, so um, we are at 4.15. Um, so I'm trying to see here if, um, so I have a bunch of the slides related back to the fishery that may be useful as an example. I'm not gonna uh, go over. Um, so I'm just gonna decide whether I wanna include them in another lecture or an auxiliary lecture, but they're really just meant to be an example of how to use this tipping point analysis to apply to the fishery. And so, um, you know, and, and, and better understand the dynamics of these things. And so um, I'll decide whether we go back to those slides, but they, at that, this point in the lecture, it goes all back to the book and we're just going over stuff from the book. So moving forward, um, the announcements and assignments is we just have one more chapter to read out of the book, chapter 10. Um, so that's uh, coming up before lecture F3. Um, you've got a muddiest point, and then also uh, this, um, if you haven't demoed your stock and flow stuff, then that'll also be due uh, Sunday night. So I think that's about everything that we have on the plate for things coming up. And so I will then leave up the attendance exercise, and my attendance exercise, my question here is, um, what is the term for a variable that we view as being constant throughout a simulation. So the only thing that changes it is you going in and manually changing it. It doesn't get changed within the model. So I'm not looking for exogenous. I'm looking for another parameter or another, I'm looking for another word that starts with a P that, um, that represents a variable that is for all intents and purposes constant through the time scale of the simulation. It requires you to manually change as the simulation operator. So, um, so that's, I'll just write that in here. What is the name of the type of variable that is constant throughout a simulation's time scale? Starts with a P. And then that's all I have for you today. I have another appointment at 4.30, but I am happy to hang around in the room here. If anybody has any questions, they'd like to, to talk to me about for the last 10 minutes, but otherwise people are free to go. And I'm sorry it's 4.19, I didn't mean to go over.
All right, I'm going to stop the recording.